Great. Um, yeah, so as Varanjara said, um, my name is Neev. I'm a final year PhD student at the in the Division of Psychiatry. Um, and today I'm going to be chatting about kind of my experience of doing a registered report. Um, and I suppose in, in preparing for this talk, I was thinking, you know, what 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 I want to hear, um, you know, if I was thinking of doing if like, you know, this time last year, if when I was thinking of doing a registered report, what would I want? What like, would have been beneficial for me to know? And then also, I suppose, just kind of reflecting on what it's actually like to do one, because I think there is, you know, that there is quite a, well, I found that there is a difference from, you know, actually reading about what a registered report is and the resources out there to then actually sitting down to do one yourself. So, um, yeah, so I just going to um, go through um, my talk outline quickly. So I thought I'd break it up into two parts. So in the first part, just kind of introducing what a registered report is so we're all on the on the same page and then just I suppose signposting everyone to some resources that I found really helpful and then I think the part two of this talk will probably be more where I'll place the emphasis and spend more time discussing the experience of doing a registered report kind of revisiting these kind of key ingredients of a registered report and then working kind of through each section and I so yeah, and just I suppose talking about my my experience and my, and my reflections on on each ingredient and each each part of the registered report. Um, so I suppose I'll talk for maybe about half an hour. Let's see how we get on in time, and then you know I really want this to be an opportunity for people to ask questions and to kind of stimulate some discussion ab about a registered report. And if there's anyone thinking of doing one like yeah, please pick my brains and and ask me um as many questions um as you'd like. But to start off, uh, I think just so like we're all on on the same page. So a registered report is a publishing format that emphasizes the importance of the research question and the quality of the methods. My toes. Oh, they're in the sun. <laughs> feedback but um so yeah so anyway so the emphasis on the important and the importance of a research question and the quality of the methods. So in, in I suppose the how a registered report differs from a standard publication is that there's actually two stages of peer review. So you can see here, I'm in that little diagram. So the first stage of the peer review happens after you've you've written your introduction and your your methods and a very detailed data analysis plan that's then sent off for review and then the idea is that you are issued so you kind of address the reviewers concerns and and, and their comments and then you're issued with something called an in principle acceptance um and this i suppose i think is the the point of novelty um in a registered report is that you are kind of you know guaranteed a publication um as long as you follow the kind of a, the plan um, that you originally set out with and that was originally reviewed by the, the reviewers. And this eliminates questionable research practices like, you know, having underpowered studies, selective reporting of results and, and publication bias. So, you know, even if, you know, so the idea is that you have a, a kind of very well thought through plan of what your study is going to look like and um, that undergoes review. And then regardless of what you find, it will be published. So it's kind of a more kind of, I suppose, realistic representation of, of, of you know, the association that you're interested in rather than just peri cherry picking the kind of interesting findings, which, you know, the, the current metric system and reward system in academia definitely promotes the kind of publishing of, of novel findings and, and, and interesting findings. So registered reports kind of aim to, to combat that. So, um, so yeah, what I would do just kind of before I get into the nitty gritty of a registered report is just to kind of go through and mention some resources that I found really helpful. I'm not going to dwell on these too much because I think, you know, in order to really make the most out of these resources, you just kind of need to sit down and, and kind of go through them yourself. But the Centre for Open Science is a fantastic introduction to registered reports. Now over 300 journals accept registered reports and this list is always expanding. So I definitely recommend checking that out. And within the Open Science website, they have lots of other articles that I think are really helpful. So a kind of a viewpoint article and that was published in 2019, which kind of talks about practical considerations. And then there's also a registered report checklist, which kind of goes through um, each of the, the key ingredients, which is similar to what I'll be talking about today. Um, so what I might do is I'll just actually I, I think I posted one in the in the chat already, but I'll post this in the chat too, just so everyone's on the same page. Um, and then the registered report checklist is also great. Um, and uh, these slides will be made available afterwards, so you can kind of go through them in your own time. Um, but I suppose, um, yeah, so 
the I broke up the kind of resources into two parts. So the first is just kind of getting started. And I suppose I've given a brief introduction to what a registered report is today in my talk. Um, and, you know, some people might be familiar with a registered report already. And um, so I, I definitely recommend checking out those resources. Um, but then I think, you know, if you do decide that, yes, a registered report kind of um, you know, suits, suits the purposes of my research project and I have the time and resources to do that, then the next step I, I'd recommend is to consult your target journal because um, they all have their own registered report guidelines, which I found really helpful because, you know, there are these kind of general guidelines for like, you know, how to do a registered report, but then the journal that you're interested in might have specific criteria. So I'd I'd start there kind of once you actually start to sit down and, and kind of draft up your registered report. And then another point that I wanted to make um, briefly today was maybe if you are starting out and doing a registered report, you might want to consider I'm doing it via the peer community and registered reports initiative. So this is a new community um, dedicated to receiving, reviewing and recommending registered reports. Um, and the idea is that rather than just submitting your uh, registered report to one journal, you submit it to PCI and then that un it undergoes the review process within this kind of community. And then they have like partner journals. And so if you are issued an in principle acceptance, by the PCI community, you can then like there's partner journals will you have a selection of journals that you can publish with. This wasn't really around when I started doing my registered report, so I, I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but um, it's definitely something uh, worth checking out um, and it's kind of gaining a lot of popularity within the sphere of, of registered reports. OK, so um, how am I doing on time? I think I'm um, fine. So OK, so yeah, so what I wanted to do, I suppose, um, I, to start talking about my experience of, of a registered report is just to have a look at kind of my the timeline of, of, of kind of my project and, and where I am at the moment. So um, I started working on my registered report last summer, so in about July, and um, I spent from July to December kind of preparing stage one. Um, and I suppose one thing and I'll mention this in the next slide. One thing to I think keep in mind is that everyone's registered report will be very different, just like everyone's like you know project is different. And um, a, a good deal of my registered report was spent doing um, some pilot analysis, and that took a considerable amount of time. Um, so um, yeah, so I but once I got that submitted, I submitted it on the thirteenth of December, and I think it was kind of. I submitted it a bit later um, than I would have liked because there was kind of some issues with some of the uh, data that I was using. Um, so it got caught in the kind of Christmas lull. So it actually wasn't picked up by the editorial office until like January. Um, but once it was sent out for review, so I think it was sent out for review on the 7th of February and I got my reviewers comments back within a month. So I think, you know, that's like for they were very extensive detailed reviews um, and I was like quite surprised that it, it was that quick and then I have well actually they only gave me three weeks <laughs> to address their concerns um, which I thought was like I didn't really have time to do it all in three weeks so um, I've actually asked for an extension and I'm going to hopefully submit by the end of April. So that's just kind of yeah my timeline of a registered report um, and just to kind of put that in in kind of about a bit of context in terms of where I'm at with my PhD. So I'm aiming to submit my PhD at the at the end of October. Um, and this is like my last big project. Um, but, you know, the whole idea of a registered report is that, you know, I've written like, you know, a good, good chunk of it. Like I've written all of stage one and then you know exactly what you're going to do in terms of your analysis. So I'm hoping that by the end of the summer, I'll have um, this kind of the, the analysis done and I'll be able to write that up and I'll submit in, in time for my PhD. Um, so on the screen as well, I've also just included a, a nice diagram of the kind of various stages of a registered report. So you it's, it's quite similar to like a standard review process. So you kind of I've submitted the stage one and I'm here at the moment. So I've um, they've invited me to revise it and hopefully I'll get my in principle acceptance um, and then I'll conduct my study. And then it kind of undergoes the the same process for stage two. So you're not like guarantee. Like, so you're, you're given an in principle acceptance, but that's contingent on you actually, you know, doing what you said you were going to do um, and then reporting all additional exploratory analyses as exploratory analyses. Um, OK, but just before I kind of get stuck into the elements of the registered report, I just wanted to give some disclaimers because, you know, as I said, everyone's registered report is, is different. 
So my study was a secondary registered report. So this means that I was using um, my analyses are all based on a pre-existing data set. So I didn't actually have to collect any of my own data. And I would imagine that undertaking a registered report for data collection based studies, it would be a very different experience. And I actually would imagine much more difficult because, you know, if anyone's collected their own data like you know the plan that you start off with versus the plan that you actually are the kind of data plan you have versus the data you collect can actually be very different because it's really hard to recruit to recruit people and sometimes the sample that you propose to uh, kind of get um you know can change a lot over the process um and you know I, and i think like that's not you being like that's not bad science it's just kind of like reality like sometimes it can be very difficult to recruit the sample you want to collect so i just kind of wanted to like preface this whole talk with just this kind of reminder that embracing open research practices isn't an all or nothing approach and like i think the most important thing um you know that uh, that yeah the most important thing for me anyway in kind of you know being open um you know being an open science champion and embracing these practices is just the kind of mindset that you have so it's about you know being transparent being open and, and being very clear about what you plan to do and how you did it um rather than just kind of jumping to the kind of what you found instead of the um, emphasis being on the how and pre-registering your study I think is, is a great first step as well. Okay so um, all of the elements of a registered report are kind of familiar um, to, to everyone here I would I would imagine because they're very uh, you know they're the same as what you'd find in, in a standard uh, standard journal article so you have your abstract you have your introduction which outlines your aims and hypotheses um, your methods and these kind of include things like your sample characteristics variables of interest your covariates data pre-processing steps and I suppose where a registered report diverges from a standard article is that there is a lot more emphasis placed on your methods so like really detailing how you're pre-processing your data what your variables of interest are, what your covariates are. And I'm going to go through each of these steps um, now for the remainder of the talk. And then your data analysis plan, again, is where you would kind of really detail what you're going to do. And the the key thing to keep in mind is that, you know, when you're thinking about like how much detail to include, um, the approach I took was like, OK, well, can will someone be able to pick up this registered report and repeat my analyses exactly? And I think that's the kind of detail that you need to um, strive to for. So in the data analysis plan, talking about your statistical tests, how you're handling your data, so outliers, missing missing data, and then this kind of point called outcome neutral criteria, which I kind of struggled to get my head around at first, but I'll, I'll discuss that in the talk. And then your inference criteria. And um, so I include pilot analysis in, in my study, and then also your data access statement this is probably similar this is more specific to secondary data analysis projects so like how much of this data have you accessed already if you're doing previous projects and then standard um, acknowledgements and your credit statement in terms of author contributions okay so um yeah so what i've decided to do for each of these kind of key ingredients is just to first focus on you know what information do i need to include and then also key points to note and these are kind of partly informed by just my experience of actually writing this registered report and planning it but then also some feedback that i got from reviewers as well and hopefully this will be helpful for for others who would like to do it in the future okay so um you know your introduction is, is quite similar to a standard standard paper in that you just need to review the literature that motivated your research question. Um, but I suppose one thing to, to emphasize is that this and this might be obvious, but you know, it should focus on the relevant literature and like set up the study aims. So um, this giving an example might kind of, you know, make this point a bit clearer. So for example, if you want to test mediation, then your introduction should like test the mediation to kind of if your study and your statistical tests aim to understand a mechanism, then your introduction should kind of emphasize the proposed mechanism. And I suppose, again, this just goes back to kind of the idea of like refining your paper so that there's a very clear thread from your introduction and, you know, your study aims through to your hypotheses and then your statistical test that you're going to use and then the inferences that you're going to use um, and the inference criteria that you're going to use to to draw conclusions from your study. So again, it's just a kind of about this consistent consistency throughout the throughout the report. And then the study aims. So 
these are the kind of, you know, again, like motivated by your literature review and they kind of build up to the aim of the study is kind of X, Y and Z. And then the hypotheses need to be specific, concise and testable. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, they should be like if, if you are proposing a directionality of effect. So, for example, if you I've included an example here, so. Um, yeah, so this can actually be kind of hard because sometimes I think when I started doing my registered report, um, just for some context, my registered report is on looking at um, how puberetal timing associates with depression risk and the role of um, brain structure in that relationship. And I didn't want to go into too much detail into the like very specifics of my own project because it's still under review in this talk. Um, but using examples can can be helpful to kind of you know, highlight um, the kind of information that you need to include. So what I've done here is just included one hypothesis that I have. So, for example, here I'm saying that we expect that earlier puberetal timing as measured using this fair, this scale, which is the puberetal development scale, we expect it to be associated with decreased white matter microstructure as measured using this metric, which is kind of specific to neuroimaging in the fornex, which is a white matter tract in the brain. So, you know, you're here like the emphasis is on okay well what is my predictor what is my outcome yeah how am i measuring how am i measuring these predictors and outcomes and then what's the direction of effect um, and i suppose i could have included more information here um it is in the report but i just didn't put it in the slide in terms of you know um what kind of what what effect size of interest am i um, am i looking for and how will i know whether or not my hypothesis has been supported so again it's just about being very specific in in the in the information that you include um, and then also one recommendation that the reviewers gave me was to maybe use a hypothesis table. So that would include like your hypothesis, your predictor, your outcome, and then the family of tests or the statistical tests that you're going to use to test the hypothesis. And then how you're going to control for things like family and wise error, so multiple comparisons. OK, um, so in terms of the methods, so like in fairness, just kind of briefly reflecting on the introduction, that was kind of the easiest part to write and it was quite fun because I think you kind of get to like really get stuck into your research question and the kind of literature behind it. And then I suppose the methods is is where the level of detail required in, this, in a registered report kind of starts to diverge from what you typically include in a, in a normal paper. Um, so um, informate, but the information again is the same. It's just about including more more detail. So sample characteristics. So like, where are you getting your data from? Your exclusion criteria. Okay, well, so are you going to ex ex exclude certain people from your analysis? Why are you going to do this? And what's the rationale for including these people? You might also want to consider a power calculation. So for my study, the sample is very large. So it's about twelve thousand people. So I. I um, and a lot of the effect sizes in neuroimaging literature are quite inflated because they're all tiny effect sizes. So I based I didn't necessarily do a power calculation. I more so used based my effect sizes of interest off existing literature in large neuroimaging samples. But a power calculation um, is, is is something to consider. Then in terms of your variables of interest, I think the main <laughs> the main point here is, as I kind of have been going on about, is just like detail, detail, detail. So often you can include a table of your variable names and a description, and especially for um, a secondary data, secondary data sets, you know, like you'll uh, often, uh, you know, you can like, for example, the data set that I work with, like there's, the, you know, tens of thousands of variables. So like actually including the the variable name. So like from the data dictionary, this is the variable that I use so that someone else could come along and they would know exactly how to repeat your study. And then also what quality control and pre-processing did you do? So, you know, there's a the the raw data that you get from your like Excel sheet or from your or um, or your or file from the actual data that you use in your models like that's a that, that a lot of changes can happen to the data in in that in that process and often that's not sufficiently documented in lots of the um, existing research out there so you've no idea how someone went from this raw variable to this kind of um, measure that they're using in their models um, and flow diagrams can be very useful here um, and yeah and then also I suppose just kind of very practical things like using headings that correspond to your analysis plan. So really specifying what your independent variable in is, what's your mediator, what's your dependent variable. And I've actually included an example from my paper here. So 
this is um so I'm saying that one of my independent variables was pubertal timing. So this is a measure of your pubertal development relative to your peers. And I'm measuring this using kind of a questionnaire, but I'm also using hormone um, hormone variables. So like, uh, yeah, different hormones. Um, and actually, like there was so many different things I needed to do to the data before I um, you know, in its raw form to actually using it in my models. And, you know, it was really helpful for me to document exactly what I did um, and how I generated a, a kind of measure of pubertal timing from the kind of, you know, questionnaire score in the in the data set. Um, and obviously this will vary depending on what your research question is, but I think it's just really trying to be as specific and to document everything you can. And I think, you know, even though this is quite a lot of work, it's very helpful for like your future self. So like now, for example, when I'm going back and doing some revisions on my registered report, I don't have to go like, oh, how did I like, how did I um, quality control this variable or what what score did I use or did I exclude certain people? So like you've documented everything as you go along, which is really helpful for you and um, for your future self and also for collaborators. But yeah, so this is just kind of highlighting, you know, um, like I'm using a parent report of pubertal um, development. I'm talking about like the scale of this questionnaire and what each one means. And then I'm also talking that like, OK, for so this was kind of one of the things specific to my project, but I wanted to, to develop a or to derive a measure of pubertal timing. And there's lots of different ways you can do this. But the method that I did, I've clearly detailed here um, and that like it's a continuous measure and I'm doing it separately for males and females. So again, this is just, yeah, kind of being very specific about what you're doing and then how I'm transforming the data because it was skewed and why I'm doing that. And then all of this information is detailed in the supplementary information. Um, and then I suppose I just also wanted to highlight that if you're collecting your own data, it's good to include things like your expected sample size, a rationale behind your power analysis, and then also like a stopping rule. So, you know, when do you when are you going to stop collecting data and why is that so? And then also kind of inclusion criteria and sampling methods. OK, so then the methods is probably the kind of meatiest part of the registered report. And I just wanted to kind of continue uh, talking about it for just another minute. So in terms of the covariates, I think a lot of the time when we think about our you know, data analysis plan, we put a lot much more emphasis on our predictor and our outcome um, rather than actual rather than the covariates. And like when we're thinking about the covariates, you know, they you need to provide a clear justification for why you're including one. And often it's not just because, oh, well, that's just what other people did or like that's just what's done in the past. Like actually, like why have you included each covariate? And also, you know, why have you chosen this specific measure for this covariate? Because like, that's something that I got asked in my revisions was like, OK, well, why are you using this measure of family income specifically as your measure of socioeconomic status. So again, it's just about um, really like thinking about why you're doing it rather than just what you're doing. And then your data pre-processing steps. Um, so I won't go into too much detail here, but as I mentioned earlier, there should be a very clear journey from the unprocessed to the processed data. And one thing I found really helpful for this step is to use or markdown um, documents and also to use flow charts. So for example, here, this was the quality control um, kind of decision tree that I used. Um, so, you know, um, different stage, like different steps and different questions that I had and then how that affected my sample size. So that at the end, you have a clear idea of how you went from, OK, well, you know, there's 11, like 12,000 people in the sample, but my the kind of final sample size for the pubertal measures is like nearly 11,000. And where, why did I lose people along the way and, and why, why did I exclude them? So um, yeah, that's just kind of a method that that um, that I used. And then also supplying your code alongside your manuscript, I found really helpful. So I um, may I, I when I submitted my registered report, I um, had a link to my GitHub page and that included all of my scripts for the pre-processing. And and this is just also a good kind of, I think, check for you as a researcher just to kind of ha have someone else to scrutinize your code and for them to kind of understand how you kind of have moved through different stages of the uh, data analysis plan. Um, and yeah, and, and they, I, the both reviewers kind of commended the, the project for the inclusion of the code alongside it. Um, and actually there's a link to my GitHub page here, which I can just paste in the chat if you want to have a look at what that might look like. And yeah, happy for anyone to kind of use the scripts or use the templates or anything like that.
OK, um, so moving on to the data analysis and um, plan. So I think this was the most difficult section, in my opinion, um, but I think that it was the most difficult section because you know, this was my first really big data analysis project by myself. I hadn't really done lots of coding in advance of, of doing this project, so I think I found this data analysis um, section quite difficult because of that. But I think moving forward, I would hopefully find it a bit easier because I'm a bit more um, proficient in, in coding now. Um, but the statistical tests that you um, include should, as I said earlier, map directly onto your hypotheses. So, you know, um, here's your hypothesis. You've, um, you know, you've detailed the directionality, you've um, detailed um, your predictor and your outcome, and then you need to kind of, I, I suppose, make sure that the statistical tests that you're using map onto the hypotheses and are appropriate for your hypotheses um, and like does your data meet certain assumptions so like if you're using a specific linear model like do you, are your residuals normally distributed like so i think there's a lot of things to think about and like it can be quite overwhelming but i would definitely try and consult an expert in statistics as early as you can in your in your um in your report or in any project really because i think a lot of the time we just jump to kind of like oh well i'm going to just test this association and you don't actually put we don't give ourselves enough time to think about what we're doing um and i think that's kind of what held me up a lot of the time as well as like you know it's quite there's a lot to get your head around and i think that you know don't be afraid to reach out and ask, ask for expertise um because you know you can't be expected to be an expert in like logistic regression if you've never done it before so i definitely just to try and, and get some external support and that will strengthen your project um, again, just kind of a table might be handy or might be handy in this in this situation, just kind of detailing your predictors, your outcomes, your covariates. And then if you're doing different levels of adjustment, so like are you do, going to do a model like kind of a basic model with kind of one or two covariates and then doing a, a more full model adjusting for other things? And, and why are you going to do to do that? And then also how you're going to correct for things like multiple comparisons and, and, and at what levels this will be applied. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of I know I'm going through these points quite quickly, but, you know, these are things that you'll all have to like adapt um, to your own research questions. So I think these are just like things to keep in mind rather than exactly like what to do. Um, so sorry if I'm going through them quite quickly. Um, and then things like how are you going to evaluate model fit? Um, it, that, but this would also depend on the uh, test that you're going to do and missing data. Um, so. Yeah, so again, these are just things like what is my hypothesis? How will I test it? How am I going to interpret the results? So like if my outcome of interest is X, then I can conclude that my hypothesis has been supported if my effect size is this value, you know? So I think it is about being that specific, which which can be which can be tricky. Um, and maybe it kind of might prompt you to kind of refine your questions so you're not looking at too many hypotheses and too many research questions. Um, and this is just a table that you can get from the Centre for, for Open Science that I found um, quite useful. OK, so I'm going to just um, spend a, a kind of a few minutes talking about outcome neutral criteria. So when I first read this, I was like, I don't even know what this means. Like, where do I start? How do I start trying to understand this? So basically, the idea of an outcome neutral criteria is that it kind of does a, a check on your data plan and your data analysis plan that the obtained results are kind of basically the statistical tests that you've applied will actually test what you want to test. So, for example, like this can include like this can take a number of forms. So like testing for like floor or ceiling effects or using positive controls. And like one of the most famous positive control so a positive control test test the existence of a phenomena that would confirm the independent variable um, was correctly kind of used or like the, the dependent variable, depending on what you're looking at. Um, so that the test that you're using is capable of actually testing the main study predictions. So I think that is still kind of difficult to understand. So one of the most famous positive control experiments that I think is a good example is like, so there's this, um, so the Galileo um, spacecraft, right, was testing for the um, existence of life on Earth. Um, so if the the whole idea of like if the instrumentation of the probe that they were using on the spacecraft couldn't detect life on Earth, so I it had the had had the positive control failed, then it probably wouldn't be reasonable to use this probe to test the hypothesis that life existed on other planets. So it's kind of like if your actual test can't 
you know, identify an effect, then it probably isn't appropriate. Um, this is just my understanding of an outcome neutral criteria based on my research. If there's a stats kind of, you know, person in the audience, please, you can correct me. Um, later on and we can have a chat about it in the discussion but i think this is just something um to consider and like actually for in in my in my study like i didn't have a positive controller it wasn't appropriate to have a positive control because i wasn't really looking at like an intervention um so it can vary widely across studies but it is something to to keep in mind and also in the the journal that your target journal articles and um, registered report guidelines they detail a lot about what you need to include um in your outcome neutral criteria and then um, your inference criteria. So basically, this is just like what your primary outcome of interest is. Are you looking at beta values? Are you looking at odds ratios? Like what's your effect of interest? Um, and then, you know, how have you decided upon the minimum effect size of interest? And this can be informed by a power analysis or by um, existing research. But I think when you're trying to um, really delve into your data analysis plan. There's, you know, it's just really important to think about the rationale behind the decisions you're making. So, for example, like, you know, things like, okay, is your data nested? So, like, for example, in, in my study, like, um, there's, you know, um, so it's 12,000 young people and like there's some siblings within the sample. So like, how are you going to control for like something like relatedness in your data? Are you going to nest within family? And like, I think multi-level modeling can really <laughs> gonna be quite a headache to, to get um, to get used to initially. But again, these are just things to, to, to keep in mind and also like consult a statistician because, you know, we're not all, we're not expected or we shouldn't be expected to know all of this from, from the outset. And also like, I think if you don't, if you don't get help or um, kind of consult an expert who someone who's an expert in stats, then actually I think it can really like harbor your your progress with the registered report because you can just I found it really overwhelming and just quite frustrating not really knowing how best to, to move forward. So I think I would have definitely consulted a statistician earlier. Um, yeah, so and also thinking about like ways that your kind of models could be violated. So what I mean by this is like, let's say if you're testing something like mediation, do you and your outcome of interest is um, so like, for example, I'll just use um, in, in my project, I've been looking at the association between pubertal timing at one. I think I actually have. Yeah, so I have a diagram here. So I'm looking at pubertal timing at kind of baseline and how that um, associates with depressed symptoms at a later follow up point and how this is mediated by brain structure. Um, and like, you know, thinking about, okay, how do we control for earlier depressive symptoms? Because if the mechani mechanism that we're hypothesizing is that earlier pubertal timing comes first, incre that increases your risk for depression um, at a later time point, and then the brain plays a role in that, um, or is kind of mediating that association, you need to consider how you're controlling for, for kind of the presence of of depressive symptoms earlier on. Um, actually, my um, I won't go into too much detail, but my mediation model has actually changed um, because new data was available since I first submitted my registered report. So I'm going to basically have, um, yeah, so basically um, just um, having a think about the kind of layout of your models and whether or not there's anything that could violate that. Okay, so um, I yeah I'm, okay I think I'm going to try and wrap up um soon um soon enough but um one thing as well and this is probably just specific to to my to my project is that um the pilot date so I um included a pilot data analysis um in in my registered report and you can do this and you can do this as a way to kind of you know generate your hypotheses or you can use it to kind of um yeah basically kind of um yeah it, so I use it to generate um hypotheses because I wasn't based on the literature that was in kind of in existence I wasn't able to kind of specify um exactly you know what I wanted to look at in terms of the regions of interest so um you can use a, kind of a model building sample and then you can test that in in another sample um so that's kind of something to consider if you're using a secondary data analysis um and yeah so I'm kind of lucky that I had a sample of nearly 12,000 so I was able to basically run all my um well run my some of my analysis on 10 percent of the sample to generate regions of interest that I was going to test then um later on um, and then this is very helpful for checking that your statistical plans are appropriate. So I think it can be quite common to basically have like a holdout sample. So like, you know, um, 
So the people that I include actually in the 10 percent of the sample that I'm including in my pilot analysis won't be included in my main analysis. And I think, you know, not, and I realize that I am very lucky that I have such a big sample size that I can use. I can do that, but that's not appropriate for, for everyone. And you don't have to do pilot analysis. It was just basically when I did a review of the literature, there weren't specific enough regions of interest to test a mediation. So I needed to, to do pilot analysis to generate those re brain regions of interest. OK, so then um, I kind of I'll just go through this quite quickly. But inter if you are using a data, a secondary data set, then you need to um, basically just kind of state what access to the data you've had already and your co-authors. And most journals are happy with a self certification. So just kind of talking, just saying like, well, you know, we've ac we've had access to this data. Here are the variables we looked at. We haven't checked, tested X, Y and Z. Um, um, and that seems fine. I didn't get any comments on that from reviewers. OK, um, so yeah, so this is just this is my last slide and I thought, sorry, and I feel like that was quite a whirlwind to go through, but there's quite a lot of um, detail and, and points to, to mention. But just like reflecting kind of generally on, yeah, just reflecting generally on the process. So um, a registered report is a lot of work, um, but I do think that it's worth it. Um, and I think yeah, so I, and I do think it's worth it. And I think the difficulties that I had kind of stemmed from like from from different um, from different places. First of all, you know, I didn't really have you know, I'd never done a big I could never done a mediation model before. I'd never used like complicated linear mixed effects models. So actually doing a registered report really developed my understanding of of statistics um, and it can encourage collaboration early on in the project life cycle. So, you know, I worked with people that I wouldn't have had a chance to work with otherwise. And it was just really lovely to kind of have the time to think about what we're doing and how we're doing it rather than just kind of rushing to kind of testing out some models and seeing seeing what happens. So it was really it was really nice. And I think also it just really developed my understanding of of lots of different things like within kind of statistics. So like, you know, what 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 what's a positive con control outcome neutral criteria, the different assumptions that you might need to consider when designing your experiments. So I feel like um, even though it was a lot of work, I think I'm a much kind of I have much stronger research skills as a result. Um, it also helped me optimize my coding workflow. I'd never coded really before I did this project. Now I know how to use our markdown. I know how to kind of set a random seed for like to reproduce results and how to do random sampling. So, you know, that can be quite frustrating, but um, like in terms of when you just feel like you're not very competent at coding, but like I just would definitely encourage people to stick at it and it does get easier. Um, and actually, it's such a wonderful tool and I really enjoy it now. And I think going forward, if I was to do another registered report, it like those big obstacles weren't probably specific to a registered report. They were just probably just specific to to kind of you know developing as a researcher and, and gaining these research skills. Um, it also provided a huge opportunity for me to write up a big chunk of my thesis. So like, you know, um, I think a lot of the criticisms of kind of these or one concern, criticism is too harsh, where a concern that people might have is that, um, you know, this will take up too much time and you won't be able to write up. But actually, you know, I have a, like 7000 words written for my thesis as, as for this chapter. So, you know, that that's that if from stage one, including all the supplementary material. So, you know, it is worthwhile and you are creating outputs. Um, the pilot analysis took ages, as I mentioned, but that was for kind of a variety of reasons um, and there's like a lot of back and forth and actually just before I was about to submit um, a new release of data came out from ABCD, which is the data set I'm using and basically um, there was like an issue with one of my outcome variables in terms of, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, um, in terms of, um, yeah, so I had to basically go back and redo my pilot analysis just as I was about to submit because there was an issue on their side in terms of the algorithms that they used. So, you know, things, this is just kind of, this, these things happen when you're doing a project. Um, but all like another like big positive was that the review process was was excellent and really like very quick I thought and very overall very positive and really helpful and it was really nice just kind of getting some feedback on like you know okay well have you considered this and you know why don't what what about this approach or have you heard about this paper so like they were it was really it was really great um and overall um helpful 
Um, and then also uh, in principle acceptance will be really helpful when applying for future jobs. So like it avoids getting caught in this revised resubmit cycle. So like even though this might take some time, like I know that once I have a principal in principle acceptance, hopefully in the early summer, I don't need to worry about getting this published that I can just like, you know, follow the plan that I set out and then um, move forward and, and, and submit it for publication when I'm ready. OK, um, so I feel like that was quite a lot, but um, hopefully that it's just kind of wanted to reflect on, on my experience of doing a register report uh, and definitely like open open to questions um, for. I just wanted to also include this preprint here on the screen, which is basically a, a kind of so a paper that I co-authored with some people that I worked on with ABCD, but it's like a kind of user guide for working with longitudinal data sets. Um, and it, like some of it is specific, some of it is specific to ABCD, but it's kind of a general guide for a lot of the points that I covered today. So like thinking about your covariates, modeling decisions and things like that. So even if you're not working with a big data set, it's definitely something that I think will hopefully be of use. Um, I'll just post it in the chat. OK, so yeah, I think I'll stop talking then um, there. But um, if uh, yeah, anyone has any questions at all, um, let me know and happy to open up for discussion. Great, um, so will I, I might stop sharing my screen actually so I can see everyone. Um, okay, um, Vernon, or oh, sorry, who had your, oh, sorry, I think um, um, Kavi had his hand up first, sorry, I'll, and I'll go to Vernon next. Oh, am I next? This is Kavi. Oh yeah, Kavi, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, firstly, thank you. So much information you've, you've crammed into that uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, uh, I can see all the advantages. I've got two questions. Firstly, hmm. are you, is it, um, if you are doing registered reports, is it, is it, do you have to have open source code or not? That's the first question. Um, it's great that you have open source, you've put everything on GitHub, but yeah. supposing you've got a, a um, you know, a, some closed software, can you, can you do that? And if I can just put this uh, so I can then be quiet after that. The other thing is, uh, most of the register, the cases of register report I see are in, for example, your field psychology, which is mm -hmm. all, which is completely you know uh, uh, opaque to me. Um, I'm, my background is physics. I'm trying mm -hmm. to think back in physics whether you know I would have done something. But are you? Maybe you can comment on that on other mm -hmm. fields, maybe you know other sort of STM kind of uh, 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 subjects, whether whether it's as we can use it uh, with as much usefulness in, in those areas. Okay, yeah, yeah, thanks very much. They're both very important points. So I think, um, so I might come to your second question first. So just, well, actually, no, I'll do the first. So your coding question. So I don't think that you don't have to. Um, so basically, I just, you know, I, yeah, so I just decided that I would make them publicly available. You you don't have like you don't have to. That's not a requirement. Um, I think what you can do. So I I think this might vary from journal to journal. But my understanding is that most journals, once your stage one is approved, like so the first kind of stage before you do your stage one report, and um, you put that kind of you upload it to like kind of an online repository, but you can put an embargo on that so that it's not publicly available to anyone until um, you've published the rest of it. So you, know, you can kind of the idea is that like you still need to be transparent in everything that you do, but in terms of like sharing it like with everyone and putting it kind of online for everyone to access, you, you can definitely decide to what degree you want to want to commit to that. Um, so, yeah, and I think the in terms of if you use specific software, to be honest, I, I, I don't know the software that I've used is all open source, like I code mostly in R. Um, but I think as long as you, like what you could do is like if, if you provide enough detail so that if someone wanted to go and try and kind of replicate what you were doing, um, they could kind of, you know, they would probably just get in touch with you directly. Um, but as long, you know, so if you like have software that you need to pay for, like perhaps someone who wanted to, had had bought that software, wanted to use it, they could then get in touch with you. It's just that like the information, the detail is there if people want it rather than, you know, um, ideally it would be there for, 
you know, just kind of openly available so that people um, wouldn't have to kind of chase authors for it. But um, sorry, I feel like there wasn't kind of a straightforward answer to that. I think it depends. Like you're not you're not obliged to make everything um, publicly available. Um, and then your second point in terms of different fields. Um, so I do think that like psychology and like developmental cognitive neuroscience are definitely like leading the way with registered reports. And I think registered reports do lend themselves really nicely to secondary data analysis um, because you have all the data there, you know what it looks like, you know what your sample sizes are going to be. So to be honest, I think it's a lot easier C collecting your own data, I think. And, and doing that as a registered report, I think would could be quite restricting. Like, I'm not saying it's not impossible, but like, you know, like, so for example, in my research, I did collect some of my own data for a, from a smaller project. But, you know, the like, you know, sometimes it can be really hard to recruit people and you do have to make changes as you go along. Um, but I think you can like, you know, even if you're issued with an in principle acceptance for your registered report, like you can make changes. You just need to like get in touch with the reviewers and the editors to say, look, we actually can't do our original plan for these reasons. Is that OK? And it's just about kind of being transparent if you do have to diverge from the from the plan. But um, on the um, Centre for Open Science, I, there's lots of there's lots of journals there that um, like there's over 300 journals that accept registered reports. I'm not super familiar in terms of the physics side of things, but there might be journals there that are more specific to that field. And you could go and have a look at the guidelines for, for authors. I hope, they, I hope that's helpful. Um, great, um, Vernon? Yeah, so uh, first we're not supposed to swear at work, are we? But the first thing it's just a fucking excellent piece of work. So, so no, it's, it's just really good and really innovative and a great presentation. So I think it's sometimes we get straight into the questions without anyone saying that. So I think that's a very important thing to say. Thank you very much. So I've got a series of comments and some are for, for thought and some are sort of more general for the group. So mm -hmm. one of the things about this type of approach is I think there should be always some sort of statement that this is an honest attempt. It's not perfect, but it's an honest attempt. And I didn't need to do this. And then the, the other part of that statement is that the, the second part of that is I am not producing a document that you can later beat me over the head with. Yeah. And I think that's something in our culture. We really have to get the idea across that people are, are doing this for the betterment of their science. They don't have to. It's good that they do. But there's just too many people trying to say gotcha when they catch out someone who's working openly. And I think that's a culture we have to change. Um, I examined a PhD recently over in computer science and some of the computer scientists were just saying at lunch, they, you know, just one of them made the casual comment. He said, why do you always assume that GitHub will last forever? You know, I put lots of stuff on GitHub and I just never thought, yeah, just like every other platform, there's nothing to suggest that it's really going to be that durable. So we must kind of think about other alternatives. And I think OSF, the OSF platform could be one of those, but you know, it's something we should really um, discuss. Um, further and then when we think about just just a little other people in the group may have a, a on the call may have a different view but it's an interesting thing to try just try and set the seed in your software on two different computers that have different clocks and processors and you'll suddenly realize that setting the seed isn't as permanent as we think it is so even little things like that there's banana skins in the whole kind of uh, in the whole process but I, I, the positive thing about that is, you know, you could say that I set the cedars up. This was my machine. This was the processor and this was the clock speed. And that's utterly transparent. It'll take you a second to know, but it's something that could be really important when someone later was trying to duplicate the results. So I think that that sort of thing, you know, just I'd say we should all be aware of those little banana skins. Um, and then the, the sort of final thing is, um, for the sort of outcome uh, neutral criteria, I think in this group we probably benefit from a specialist coming to talk to us about it. But one of the things that I've been thinking about in that regard is how we can effectively generate synthetic data prior to analysing the real study for that sort of benefit. And I think that's something that we could maybe uh, take further. But overall, I just think it was a you know it's a really good um, a really good presentation, really interesting. But I think in terms of your work. You said this is a lot of work, but this is not just not a lot of work. It's a lot of work you would have done or done anyway, but you've just done it to a much higher standard. So I think you should really take that message away home this weekend with a glass of Chardonnay tonight thinking 
this is the sort of thing people should be doing and I've just done it. So congratulations and well done. Oh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, and hope, I, I do think like it, it was it, like it was quite daunting to I didn't know anyone that had done a registered report before I did it. But like when I heard about it, I was like, oh, well, you know, like I, I really like I really did want to embrace it as much as I can. Um, and I think it's been a, like it's been a really helpful experience. And I think it's um, yeah, I just as I said, like really solidified my understanding of a lot of these kind of key concepts that you don't like you kind of that are an afterthought rather than like a, a really integral part of, of the research process. Um, and I think like I, I was thinking about this, like, you know, as I kind of like nearly coming towards the end of my PhD, like, you know, would I would I do another one or would I do like a registered or would I do a pre-registration instead? And I, I, I think like, you know, so a pre-registration is, I think, as much work in that you need to provide as much detail if you're going to do it properly. I think, you know, people can kind of have these vague pre-registrations that they just post online. Um, but like actually, like if you want to do like if you want to do a proper pre-registration, you need to include as much work as you include in a, or as much detail as you include in a registered report. Um, and like, you know, if you're going to go to the effort of doing that much work then it would be really nice to get peer review because like you know it, it's great that you get these experts like you know so for example like in in my research group you know I, I'm kind of one of the only people that works with with puberty data so like it was I was constantly kind of questioning myself like oh my god like you know do I really know like you, you know like I, I've tried to get my head around it but like actually having experts that give you feedback on like okay well actually when you're thinking about um the puberty data like you need to you need to you should include this as an extra covariate or you know experts on stats like oh well actually you know this that violates your mediation model like it was really really helpful um and very positive so um yeah so over all, I think I would do one again. Um, but I think, again, I'm really lucky that I have such a wonderful resource like ABCD to be able to kind of say, oh, you know, I'm only going to I'm going to like, you know, disregard 1000 participants because they were in my sample, they're in my pilot analysis, like not everyone can do that. Um, but I think if we can, like, regardless of whether you do a registered report or not, if you can move forward with this kind of approach to research in mind, I think, you know, it would really strengthen um, everyone's research um, experience and, and skills too. Um, does anyone have any other questions or is anyone thinking of doing a registered report or has anyone done a registered report that's here? I'm going to ask a I question because Gary be... Smith has a question. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. I think Gary I'm Smith thinking... has a question. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. In the chat. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, um, so. So, so I am keen to start doing, so this is from um, Carrie. So I'm keen to start doing registered reports, but I had seen that someone had their registered report being cited instead of their actual finished publication, which has impact on REF and your H index. Do you think that this is an issue or does anyone else in the group have experience of this? So was this like their stage one was being cited? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not 100% sure because like my understanding is that like the, so it, it it depends on the journal, but like your stage one is um is like kind of okay yeah well so I suppose you could that's kind of like citing a preprint but I suppose with the say with the stage one like you don't have any results so I would kind of I'm not wonder I'm wondering in which context that was cited because there were there shouldn't have been any findings really um but like I kind of I wonder well maybe. Because if for example, I'm just thinking about like preprints, so like normally if you upload a preprint, that is on like your Google, your Google Scholar page, and then once the actual like article is published, then I think that replaces it from my experience anyway. I don't know if that, if that um um differs, but um yeah, I think I think also like I feel like this will kind of change going forward. I mean like it is quite a new publishing platform, um but I I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, um um. I, I yeah. had a question as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so first, I uh, loved your presentation. So impressed by your experience during registered reports. Um, so I know that my if I were to do a registered report, it would look nothing like yours because I don't have 1200 12, participants. Um, and is there a repository or a library or maybe for each different journal? Um, off registered reports that somebody who has not done one, who's never seen one, and who is working in a field that does not really have a lot of people doing registered report can 
have a look at what it's supposed to look like and what they should work on when writing their own registered report. Yeah, so I think it depends on the journal. Um, so I think like, for, so I'm submitting to developmental cognitive neuroscience um, as the journal and they had like so a few registered reports, but like not not many. Um, like I think the best bet to look at like samples of registered reports would be on the OSF. So I think um, authors are encouraged to upload a stage one registered report and you should be able to hopefully narrow down um, like narrow down the search criteria so that it would fit yours more than than like let's say like yeah you'd find a registered report that's more suitable to to your research questions and your research field. Um, so I think there are lots of resources out there in terms of looking at samples, um, and and yeah, because but again I think like there most of the samples exist within like kind of cognitive neuroscience or in psychology. Um, so but you can have a like I think you know even the guidelines that journals provide for registered reports like I found those really really helpful. Um, and as well I think even doing something like the PCI registered reports that might be quite like a, a useful starting point because you'll get kind of um, feedback from from people um, on, on that platform and you're not like tied to a specific journal. Um, Thank you. Um, it is two one minute before the end of the meeting, so if nobody ha else has a question, I guess we can say goodbye for now. And thank you so much, Neve, for this amazing work and for this very useful presentation. Yes, Vernon, saying something? No? I don't know if Vernon is trying to say something or not, or if I froze, or I don't know. I think he's frozen. Um, um, but yeah, also I think I, I just want to, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I think there's just this message that I need to send that the deadline for the main contributions for Edinburgh Open Research Conference has been extended till March 31st, 2 p.m. Yeah. Just so everyone, you know, can submit after the strike week and also the registrations for students, masters, undergrad and PhDs are also open now. Yeah. Amazing. Well, uh, thank you again, Neve. Thank you, everybody, for attending and I have a lovely rest of your day. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.